All right, very good. All right, so optional, the mother of all bike sheds. Uh, so optional was a class that was introduced in Java 8, and uh, it's largely been overshadowed by all the other great things in Java 8, like streams and lambdas and so forth. Uh, but it has attracted an, uh, a disproportionate amount of attention. And so um, I am going to get into, into that bit. But what I really want to do is go over the basics of optional and how to use it, most importantly, how to use it effectively. Um, and uh, so after I've gone through some of those examples, I want to talk about ways that I've seen optional misused and uh, show you why I think those are actually misuses. And then not really going to spend any time on bike shedding, but it is, uh, <laughs> it is uh, an interesting phenomenon that optional has attracted so much, so much attention for such a small API. All right, so moving in, what is optional and why is it useful? Okay, so optional is uh, it's a small family of classes. The, the reference type optional of T was introduced in Java 8, and it has only two states. It can contain a reference to an object of type T, or it can be empty, and that's basically it. Um, so if it does contain a reference, uh, sometimes, uh, in fact, um, uh, quite frequently, we refer to that as being present or having a value present in the optional. And if the optional is empty, then sometimes we say the value is absent. And I would caution you not to say that the optional is null because that's very confusing. Or I would, I would recommend avoiding saying the optional is null or the optional contains null because uh, strictly speaking, those are inaccurate, but it's also very confusing. Uh, OK, so along with the optional of T, the reference type, there are also primitive specializations for int, long, and double. Uh, they are mostly analogous with optional uh, of the reference types. I'm not going to be talking about them. Um, mostly, I'm going to be focusing on optional T. Um, finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so every so optional is a reference type. And so we have objects of type optional. And in, in Java, um, any object, any reference to an object can be null. And so that's distinct from this notion of an optional object being present or absent. And so uh, rule number one here is never use null as a reference for an optional. So don't put null into an optional variable, or if you have a method that returns an optional, never return null from it, because that just confuses things. All right, so why is optional useful? So this is sort of a bit of uh, background in history here. Um, and it goes back to when we were designing the Streams API. Uh, we knew uh, we wanted to have some kind of operation on a stream which would um, it would do some finding or searching for, for objects within the stream. And we wanted that to be based on a predicate. So, so let's have a simple, simple example here. Um, let's say you have a list of customers. And let's say each customer has a customer ID. And we want to search that list for the customer that has a particular ID. So how might we do this? So uh, Actually, before I go on, I should say that this search operation does not exist on streams. This is an early draft API. Uh, and so we've changed things since then. And I'll show you the real API uh, later on. But remember, this is during the development of Java 8. We knew we wanted some kind of search operation. So let's say we have an operation that searches for uh, an element of the stream that matches this predicate. So it seems pretty straightforward. We take a stream out of the customer list and search for something that matches this predicate, where the customer, customers, we get the ID out of it and then see if it matches the customer ID. So the immediate question is, what happens if there is no element in the stream that matches this predicate? So kind of the obvious thing to do is for it to return null. And in fact, that's the first way we had it, because that's kind of the way Java is. Uh, if you have something that can return a value, then it returns that value. But if it, if it, if it doesn't have a value, or if, it, if it's searching for something and you can't find it, it returns null. 
And that's pretty traditional with uh, Java APIs. Um, so if you look at this, uh, if you look at this method here, this simply returns the result of calling the the hypothetical search operation on the stream. And so if that returns null, then this customer by ID method also returns null. Okay, so far so good. Well, now suppose we wanted to refactor this and say, okay, let's have a method that returns the, the customer's name that matches this ID. And so our customer might have a get name method on it. So you might say, ah, okay, so let's uh, get a stream, search it for this customer ID, and then um, get its name. Great. So if there's a customer there, it returns its name, which is a string. Um, of course, there's a big problem here, which is this is very, very neat code. But if the customer isn't found, then get name will be called on a null reference, which will throw a null pointer exception. So we can't do that. So instead, what we have to do is store the, the return value of search in a local variable and test it, test it for non-null. And only if it's non-null do we call the get name method on it. Uh, otherwise, we return something else, like you know, some unknown, you know, some, some other string or, or something else. And uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty bad. I think uh, Java programmers are used to this. Um, but uh, this, is, uh, this is a very common error to make. Um, it's very nice to be able to chain methods and uh, compose operations this way. But uh, this fact that we have to store the intermediate result in a local variable and check it against null before, um, uh, before calling another method on it is it adds a lot of clutter and it's easy to forget. So the penalty for getting it, the penalty for forgetting it is that uh, you might get a null pointer exception. All right, so we felt that we needed to do something more than that. I mean, we could have just proceeded with the uh, we could have just proceeded with the usual uh, the usual bit about returning null, but uh, we thought we could do better, and so we introduced this concept of an optional. And this is not really new in Java. I mean, it's new to Java, but uh, many other systems have something that is something that is an option or an optional or something like this. But basically, some value that that indicates explicitly whether or not it has value. So the, the rationale here is that we decided to introduce optional as a library API. So this is in java.util. Uh, there's no language support for this. This is just a library API. And it's a limited mechanism for methods to use in return types when there's a need to represent a result or possibly no result, and when using null is overwhelmingly likely to cause errors. So this thing I have up on the screen here that I, that I basically paraphrased, um, so this is, uh, this is me and Brian Getz deciding you know, what, what, is, what, what is optional really? And I think um, a lot of the discussion around optional has been that uh, has been because it is not solving some problem that is outside the scope defined here. So again, so it's a limited mechanism. It is primarily aimed at method return types, and it is most useful in order to prevent errors, such as the one I just illustrated, where if something returns null and you attempt to call a method on it, you'll get a null pointer exception. Now, there are a bunch of other potential places where you might think, oh, it would be really great if I could use optional. And I'm going to cover some of those, but um, you know, since, since, those are, since, since those are outside the intended scope of optional, it's not as, you can use optional for anything you want, actually. It's, it's not an error, but it just doesn't work very well for those other use cases. And so I'll, I'll uh, show some of those later on. All right, so let's, uh, let's get back to our example and uh, revisit it and see if we can apply optional. So now this is the real streams API. Instead of search, there are operations on streams called find first and find any. And they're slightly different. Instead of taking a predicate, what they do is they rely on a filtering operation to be done upstream. So this is equivalent code from what I showed before. We have a customer list. We run it through filter. We, we filter it through a predicate. And then we call find first. And now we want to we get the customer that results from it and called get name on it. 
OK, so this doesn't work because find first does not return a customer. It returns an optional of customer. So what we need to do is now that I'm just going to introduce this local variable here temporarily. So let's say we call our stream pipeline and terminate it with find first, and we store the optional of customer in a local variable. So now we have an optional customer, and we want to get to a customer in order to call get name on it. So how do we do this? All right, well, the obvious thing to do is to call get on it, because get gets the value out of an optional. All right, that's great. So this works fine if our stream found a customer from the list, but what if it doesn't? What happens if you call get on an optional that is empty? Oh, actually backing up, suppose, suppose find first finds no matching element in the stream. Well, what it does is it returns an empty optional. If you call get on an empty optional, it throws no such element exception. Well, great. So now we've replaced null pointer exception with no such element exception. This is hardly an improvement. All right, so now with that set up, I'm going to run through a bunch of use cases for how to use optional. So the first thing to do is make sure we get a value from optional safely. And so again, an optional can have a value present or it can be empty. So sort of an obvious thing to do here is to put a check in front of it. So here we say return. Before we return the value, we test to see whether it has a value present. And so that is the, the is present method on the optional. It returns a Boolean indicating whether it has a value or not. So if it does have a value, we say opt.get.getName. That's great. Otherwise, we return some, you know, some replacement string. All right. Well, again, we really haven't improved anything because now we are calling optional dot is present instead of like in our in our hypothetical search operation we just had to check the return value for null so so still this is this is basically the same it's just that we're spelling things differently so so this is again not an improvement over the previous situation but i would like to take an aside at this point because there are a few more rules that i wanted to mention with respect to this example. So rule number two, never use optional.get unless you can prove that the optional is present. So, so this, uh, this code on the screen is safe because it does check for is present before calling optional.get. And, and it never, never calls get on an empty optional. So it is safe. Now it can be improved. And I am going to show that in the, in the subsequent slides. Um, but it is safe. So this does satisfy rule number two. But I think we can do better. And I'm going to introduce rule number three. Um, oh, sorry, a consequence of rule number two is that I think most people, mean, so I shouldn't say most people, I have seen a lot of code where people understand rule number two. And they say, oh, OK, well, before calling get, I just have to call is present. So I just have to, I just have to do that check every time. And Again, that's safe, but we can do better than that. And that's what rule three is telling us. Prefer alternative APIs over is present and get. Now there are some times that is present and get are really necessary. But I would say that 80, 90% of the cases, you can use other optional APIs and, and make your code cleaner without having to resort to calling is present and then get on that optional. All right, so let's uh, so let's look at these. Um, so here are uh, I'm going to take a, a little bit of a digression here before coming back to our example, but I wanted to introduce the what I'm calling the or else family of methods on an optional. So instead of just getting the value out of an optional, um, there's a family of methods called or else and or or else get. Or, or else throw that that get a value if it's present or else something else. And so there are three of these here. So this little snippet here, opt dot or else default data. So what that does is if the value is present, it returns it or else it returns a default value. So or else get is pretty similar. If the value is present, So 
Sorry, I'm getting a phone call here. Okay. If the value is present, it returns that value, or else it gets a replacement value from the supplier. And so here the example is I call a, uh, I use a constructor reference to construct some new, new data item. Um, and then the third example is or else throw, which is, again, it returns the value from the optional if that value is present or else it throws an exception. So the, uh, the interesting thing about um, the second version, the uh, one that uh, or else get, which calls a supplier, if you don't have a value handy, uh, a if your optional is empty and you don't have a replacement value handy, you uh, and it, or it's um, expensive to construct it, then you want to defer creation of that replacement value uh, until the time you know that it's necessary. Whereas the plain or else, um, the semantics of, of Java argument um, uh, argument processing for method calls is that the arguments are all um, are all evaluated prior to the method call. So using or else get allows you to delay creation of the replacement value until afterwards, uh, until until you know that it's necessary. And um, so there's another case which is or else throw, which is um, if the value is not present by default. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, get will throw no such element exception. Um, but suppose you want to throw a different exception. Uh, that's what or else throw is used for. All right, so now we have a family of uh, methods that uh, provide some additional flexibility in dealing with an optional. And I'm going to introduce another method here, which is map. So, so OK, so now we're going to go back to the example I had earlier. So this is the same stream pipeline. I, I I'm searching through the customer list, filtering it through this simple predicate, and calling find first. So I have an optional of customer, which might or might not have a customer in it. And then the return statement is the, the same is the same as it was before. I test, is it present? And if so, I get its name, otherwise return a replacement value. So if you look at what's going on here, this is this is saying if the value, if there is a value present in the optional, I want to take that value and transform it somehow, or transform in the sense of mapping it to some other value. So that's exactly what the map method on optional does. If there's a value present, it calls that lambda or method reference to transform that value into something else and returns an optional containing the result of doing that. OK, so now, if, if there was a value present, it calls get name on it, and we get a string that's wrapped inside an optional. But if map is called on an empty optional, then it just returns an empty optional. So we still have an optional that needs to be unwrapped. But we've transformed it from a customer into a string. Or more precisely, we've transformed it from an optional of customer to an optional of string. Now, at this point, we can chain or else onto the end. So as I mentioned earlier, or else gets the value if it's present, or else it substitutes the value provided here. So this last return statement here does exactly what the, uh, what the grayed out return statement above did. It's just that does it in a much more concise fashion. Now, since we uh, I had broken out the optional into a local variable just for clarity, but there's no reason we need the local variable anymore. And so what this enables us to do is to chain the optional method calls directly onto the end of the stream. So I've done that here. And so you, you can see that this reads very fluidly. We have stream pipeline that terminates at find first. We map that result into something else from the customer to the customer name. And we return that name or else return some string unknown if no such customer was found. So this is a little odd because it looks like a much, it looks like a longer stream. But uh, um, if you read it carefully, you can see that the stream pipeline terminates halfway through. And then you kind of have to know that find first returns an optional and that the subsequent method calls are method calls on the optional, not on the stream. All right, moving on. There is a filter method on 
um, on optional. And so this example is a different shifting ground here. This is one that I found in the OpenJDK. Um, there was some layer code in the uh, in the in the jigsaw work that is um, um, <clears> that's <throat> you know, part of the uh, module system in JDK nine. And so people have started to use optional, but uh, I think the 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 usage of optional is uh, is not very good. And so what this code, I, I've, I've cleaned up this code a little bit for the sake of this example. But basically, this code is inside a layer object. And it's been handed a configuration. And so the task of this code is to verify that the, um, the parent of the configuration that was passed in is the same as this layer's configuration. OK, and so that's that's basically what this does. And, and interestingly, the parent method on a configuration object returns an optional of configuration. And the reason is that the configuration might or might not have a parent. OK, so, so the task here is we get the configuration's parent, and now we have to test to see whether it matches this layer's configuration. And so this is kind of straightforward code to do that. All right, so if. If there is no value present, uh, sorry. If sorry, you got to see. We already got tied up in the uh, in the booleans here. I mean, you, it's easier for you to read read the code on the screen than for me to describe it here. But basically, uh, it's doing a boolean condition here, and but basically, if the value, it's I'm kind of going to invert it here. If there's a value present, but it's not the same as this layer's configuration, we want to throw an exception. And so that's what that's the logic that this test is trying to perform, and you know it's okay. I mean, I think it's correct code, uh, but I think we can do better by using the filter method on optional. So that's what this code at the bottom of the slide does. So what filter does is, if there's any value present, it filters it through the predicate, and if it doesn't match the predicate, then the result is empty. Otherwise, it just passes that that value through, and of course, if the optional was empty to begin with, then the result is an empty optional. So what we're saying is we want there to be, uh, we want any configuration from, uh, sorry, we, we, we want any, any, any parent configuration of the configuration passed in is filtered through our test here. And if, if it is present, then that's fine. Or else we want to throw an illegal argument exception. So, so a couple things going on here. So one is we're using these methods on optional to, um, to make the code to, we're using chain method calls on optional to make the code read in a more straight line, uh, straight line linear fashion. Um, and we're also using lambdas and method references here. Uh, <clears throat> instead of having this logic broken out in, uh, in this particular way. All right, so that's the example of filter. Uh, there's another method on here on optional called if present. And, and this is rather unfortunate because if present is too easily confused with is present. So if present invokes a lambda, a, a consumer, um, on the optional's value, if there's one present, others will, otherwise it does nothing. And not to be confused with is present, which returns a Boolean indicating whether there's a value present. Uh, and so the so example here, this is another example from somewhere in the JDK. We want to get a task from somewhere, and we have an optional task. And here again, it uses the straightforward code. We test to see whether there is a task present. And if there is, we, um, we get the task and call an executor to run it. But we can do better than that by using if present. So here's what that looks like. We say get task, which returns an optional of task. And if it's present, we just invoke this Lambda expression on it, which, which causes the executor to run the task. Or actually, this can be converted into a method reference, which makes it uh, a little nicer. So that's how if present can be used. 
All right, a few more methods. This is just some, some cleanup here to round out the optional API. Uh, so how do you create an optional? And there are no constructors on it, at least no public constructors. Um, two, main, two main ways of creating optionals are using static factory methods. Optional.empty returns an empty optional, and optional.of returns an optional containing that reference t. And note in particular, for this method, t must be non-null. Um, equals and hash code behave pretty much as you expect. And uh, actually, and, and um, the interesting thing about equals is that it works quite well with uh, unit testing. So for instance, a uh, question came up on Stack Overflow. How do, I, how do I unit test a method that returns an optional? And the easiest way is to make your expected value be an optional and then and then assert equals we'll call equals on the optionals against each other and it will do the right thing so if i expect some value to be present i assert equals with optional dot of some expected value and the return value of that method uh, and if i expect the value to be empty i assert equals with optional dot empty so that works quite nicely all right, so here's a, here's a slightly more complicated technique. Sorry, the slide is a little busy here, but let me walk you through it. Let's say that we have a list of customer IDs, and we want to convert that into a list of customer. And so, pretty clearly, that will look up that will involve looking up a customer by a customer ID. And let's just say if we can't find a customer corresponding to that ID, that we just want to ignore it. So, so let's say that we have a find by ID method that returns an optional of customer. And so in Java 8, this is, uh, this is not, not too difficult to do, but you have to, have to look at things a little bit in the right way to understand that. So we get our customer ID list, stream it, and then map it by calling find by ID. So what we get out of that is a stream of, a stream of optional of customer. And so now what we want to do is unpack those optionals. We want customers, not optional of customers. But first, we want to make sure that we only unpack the ones that are present. So we filter through optional is present, and then we map that through optional get. And so one of my earlier rules said that only call optional get if you can guarantee that a value is present. So by structuring filter and map this way, um, we've successfully done that. And um, so anyway, so what we get out of the map operation is a stream of customer, and then we just collect that into a list. So that works reasonably nicely. In Java 9, um, there's, uh, there's a new method on optional called stream, which turns an optional into a stream of zero or one elements, depending, of course, on whether that optional is empty or whether it has a value present. And so this is quite amenable to uh, being called from the flat map stream operation. And so we can fuse the filter and map operations from the Java 8 example above in Java 9 by simply calling flat map on optional.stream. And so that's a, a pretty effective way to, to get a stream of optionals and to, to, to weed out the ones that are empty and to filter out the results. All right, um, I think Trisha G referred to this in her earlier uh, VJUG presentation. There's uh, uh, sometimes difficulty converting a code base uh, from, from being null-centric to optional-centric. Um, and if you do that, you will invariably find places in the code where one chunk of code wants to deal with nulls and another chunk of code wants to deal with optionals. So uh, there are a couple methods you can use to, to use in converting or adapting between those layers of code. So if I have a null reference and I want an optional from it, there's another static factory method called optional.ofNullable. You hand it a reference. And so if, if you hand it a null reference, then it says, oh, OK, since that's null, I'm going to convert that into an empty optional. Now, most importantly, there is no notion of an optional that is present that also contains a null reference. I think you can see that would be very confusing. Um, so 
if an optional has a value present, that value is always non-null. And so if you call optional of nullable with a null reference, then that turns into an empty optional. All right, you might want to go the other way. Um, if you have an optional and you want some a, a reference that is null or non-null, you can simply say optional dot or else null. And I think that's the only time you should call or else null um, if you're adapting to code that really does want to have null references. Um, otherwise, I see or else null um, rather overused. Um, people are, I think, pretty comfortable with nulls, and so. Uh, sometimes I see them unpacking an optional to null and then later on um, testing that reference against null. So whenever you see that, that's, a, that's usually an indication that you can bring more logic back up into the optional and chain methods off of it. All right. Um, moving on here. Um, I have an example of some code that is not what I would recommend. Um, so for instance, um, a lot of this code comes from Stack Overflow. And a lot of people like to chain uh, method calls on optional, you know, because it's kind of a cool thing to do. All right. But here, somebody's saying, OK, well, I have a, I have a string value in my method. Uh, I, I have a string value that's being passed into my method. And um, uh, I want to change some methods off it. So I convert it into an optional, and then I call or else get to call a supplier if it's empty. And you know this is sort of standing on your head to do something very simple, which is you know if somebody gave you a nullable reference, just test it against null. And so that's what the code at the bottom does. So here's rule number four. So it's generally a bad idea to create an optional for the express purpose of chaining methods on it. There, there are quite often better ways to do it. And so notice the code in, code in the bottom doesn't use optional at all. And I don't think it needs to. So, so don't use optional if, if you have a case like this. All right. Um, so there are some sort of built-in condition operations on, on optional method chains. Um, and you can, really, uh, you can really stand on your head to get method chaining um, in such a way that you can avoid writing out if statements. Um, so here's an example, another one from Stack Overflow. Uh, somebody had a problem where they had two optional of big decimal, and they wanted to add them. And, and the result would be another optional of big decimal. And the optional would have the sum unless both of the input values were empty, in which case the result should also be empty. That's kind of an odd case, but you know, let's run with it. I don't know exactly what he was trying to do there. So here's, here's one example. Uh, one example answer. Somebody, and this is pretty clever, I admit. Somebody created a stream from two optionals and then used this filter is present and map get. It used the same technique I showed a little bit earlier. And then it passed it into reduce over adding the big decimals. And so given one or two present big decimal values, then it would add them. Um, and so that's correct. And reduce is kind of interesting, because if you give it an empty stream, it returns an, op an empty optional. So this is, you know, this gives the result as intended, but it's, it's a little bit obscure, if you ask me. So I don't recommend that. So here's another answer that was posted. This is, this is even more obscure. And I'm not even going to bother trying to explain that. And so on it, you know, if you're if you're looking at this, I'll post my slides later. You can look at this or take a screen snapshot or something and puzzle through all the different cases and and see how long it takes you to convince yourself that that this code is correct. Um, I believe it is correct, uh, but boy, I, I I found this hard to understand. Um, I did want to note a couple things going on here. One is that there's a chain of chain of method calls off of optional. And there's a nested chain of optionals inside a Lambda that adds some complexity. And then uh, trust me, if you work through this example, one of the intermediate results is optional of optional of big decimal. So think about that for a while. So, so here is the way I would write this code, which is basically exactly the way the problem statement is. If both values are absent, you want an empty optional. Otherwise, you 
unpack each optional or substitute zero if they're empty, add them, and wrap that up in an optional. So it's certainly more, more characters than the previous one. But I think it makes a lot more, more sense. And coincidentally, it, <laughs> the code reads exactly like the problem statement. And I think there's a big benefit to that. So this is verging onto matters of style, but uh, I encourage you to, to think about things this way. And so here I'm going to state my rule, which is based on the previous code. If you have a chain of optional methods and you have a nested chain, or if one of your intermediate values is optional of optional of, of some type, it's probably too complex because I think either of those characteristics make dealing with optional, reading code that deals with optional in those ways uh, very difficult. All right, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm entering it into the record here. Um, uh, there was, uh, this was at Jax, Jax 2015, a um, year and a half ago or so. Um, Angelica Langer was interviewing Brian Getz, who's the uh, Java language architect at uh, Oracle. Um, and she asked him, or actually the question from the, uh, from the audience was what his biggest regret was. And he gave this little speech about optional.get. And um, it's interesting because optional.get is unusual uh, in that uh, unlike most other get calls around the library APIs, it throws an exception if, if nothing is there, whereas most other things return null or, or although do something reasonable. So optional.get is, is, um, is problematic for this reason. So, um, so let me explain this a little bit. Uh, get is the first thing you reach for because it's the obvious thing. And so its short name would think that you would use it all the time. But as my preceding examples show, uh, there are often many better ways to use get, or, sorry, many better ways to get a value out of an optional than to use get. Um, so it's, it's very easy because you know, it's the obvious thing to reach for, but it's error prone because it's easy to use and forget to check for uh, check to see whether the value is present. Or if you do remember, you will just lock into this style of calling is present and then get instead of using one of the other nicer methods. So we've come to the conclusion, um, Brian and I at least, and, and other people have, have oh, and also I should mention, I've done a survey of uh, JDK code and uh, open source code, and I do see get misused quite often. And so our conclusion from that is that this is, uh, this is a bad API. And so there's an idea here, which is to, to replace get with something else uh, by deprecating it and adding a, adding a substitute. Um, but, uh, but it turns out that um, deprecation creates a lot of warnings. And I think um, at this stage in the game, adding, adding too many warnings is uh, not something we want to do. So um, we are... So we're not going to execute this plan as it stands, uh, but we do want to pursue some way of, of, of getting people to avoid using get if possible. And so here I've reiterated rules number two and three for your reference. All right, a couple places not to use optional. Um, this requires actually more, more explanation than I have time for, but um, I would say to avoid using optionals in fields, in method parameters, and in collections. Um, usually storing an optional field is not what you want to do. It's kind of attractive to do, but it's, it's often better to substitute a replacement value at the time the field is stored instead of actually storing the optional. Um, most things have some kind of null object or empty object that can be substituted. Or if the, if, uh, if the field is private and the amount of code that uses it is limited, just go ahead and use null. Um, that, uh, that's often more effective than using optional for field. Uh, something I, I see people try to do repeatedly is to say, oh, optional. Uh, I have a method that wants to take uh, uh, arguments that might be optional. So I'm going to declare them to be of optional type. But that, that doesn't really work at all, because what it does is it forces your callers to box everything into optional, uh, optional objects. So instead of calling my method with some value, I have to say my method of optional of some value, or optional empty. 
So I have to, so at the call side, I have to write out all of this stuff in, uh, instead of, instead of something else. Uh, so optional is not really buying you anything here. Um, and finally, in collections, I think there's there's a much longer discussion to be had about this. But my experience is that if people store optionals in collections, it 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 makes things seem a little weird, and there is often a better way of representing what they want to represent uh, than actually storing an optional in a collection. So I'm stating rule six here: avoid using optional in fields, method parameters, and collections. Um, quick note here about performance. Um, we would like there to be value types, which are much cheaper, but that is uh, a future version of Java, Project Valhalla. That's still a ways off in the future. Meanwhile, an optional is an object. So if you put something in an optional, it's like boxing it. And so that adds overhead. So creating one optional is not a problem. But I've seen people say, oh, OK, I have some, some massive tree structure. And uh, I might or might not have a parent, so I'm going to make that. Uh, I'm going to make one of my fields be an optional. Well, if you if you think about it, if you have a tree node, um, every node in the tree except the root has a parent. So that means you've doubled the number of objects in your system, and that might or might not be a performance problem, but it potentially could be. If you have double the number of objects, maybe that ha says something about your GC pressure. Maybe it adds latency for every dependent load. Every time every time you want to dereference that, you have to load the optional and then load the reference out of it. Um, so it's something to be aware of. I'm not going to say that it is always a performance problem. But uh, if you are not paying attention to this, you can create performance problems for yourself. Um, also, more advice. Um, nulls are still very much part of the language, and there are times when it is perfectly appropriate to use them. Uh, it is not a goal of optional to replace every usage of null. And if you go and try to replace every null with an optional, you're going to get yourself into some kind of trouble. Um, I mean, you can, you can certainly get things to work, but uh, you're going to clutter up your code and uh, potentially create a performance problem. Um, so I, I do not recommend trying to replace every null with optional. There are certain, uh, there's, there are many contexts in Java where dealing with null is uh, is perfectly fine. All right, so I'm coming to the uh, to the end here. I'm not going to cover all of this. I will just allude to it, but I will just say every time optional has come up on any of the uh, OpenJDK mailing lists or even outside of OpenJDK, there have been a whole series of questions and issues and so forth for, for what is such a simple class, which can be empty or have a value present. There are an enormous number of design decisions. So in Java, so in Java 8, 8, we, uh, we uh, made, made decisions, decisions on all of those. Um, but it um, seems, but it that, seems that, that there's, there's a lot of disagreement about every single one. one. So here's, so a, here's, a, here's a, subset a subset of, of uh, issues, that issues that people have raised. raised. Um, I think, I think most, of them, most of them are reasonable. You can imagine, you can imagine some in some other, other context, context or some, or other, some other usage model, model that uh, design decisions do the other way. 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 Uh, but uh, but for Java 8, we decided that we would make optionalized wise and People, people still complain, still about, complain it. about it. So, so the result, the result during during optionals, optionals the design of optional, optional and and any time it's come up on JDK, 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 that's resulted in, result in, in hundreds, 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 hundreds of, of, of email, emails, emails, all, all centered around, around these topics, 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 swirling, swirling back and forth, and so forth, and so forth. So, so, so um, um, but that's all. That's all I'm going to say. I think if anybody sees me at a conference and wants to hear more about this, I think this is a topic for. For for, 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 uh, for for discussion over beer, beer. beer. Uh, I, I do not do not have time to cover all of these issues. And I think some of these some issues are very interesting, interesting, but uh, um, not not for this not presentation. For this presentation. All right. All right. Uh, summary and conclusion. conclusion. Basically, I'm just going to restate the design goals of optional, optional. a limited mechanism for library method return types in cases where using null is overwhelmingly likely to cause errors, and then. I will uh, put up these the summary of the rules that I uh, that I went through uh, in this presentation, and this is basically it. Uh, these are these are my recommendations um, for writing good code using optional. So so happy programming, and uh, enjoy effective use of optional. 
Thank you, Stuart. Uh, that was really educational and it showed a lot of practical wisdom. Uh, if I can bother you for a second, can you please check the connection on, on your microphone? I think the last minute we got a, a weird echo going on, making you sound like a Darth Vader. Really? Okay, so how am I coming through now? Oh, no, it's better. Not sure what what has happened to just switched on for weird uh, at the weird moment of time. Okay. Probably nothing uh, specific, but uh, it was at the very end, so the presentation was not affected. Uh, uh, let me just ask quickly if the RC has any questions. I know that we had one and it was a little bit discussed and it was partially covered by your rule number four. So maybe you could just come back to that and reiterate quickly. So uh, the, the initial question was uh, if there is more sense to make if optional, if present, return optional rather than uh, void, uh, Boolean, right? So currently uh, if present is a check if an object is wrapped into the optional. So returning an optional from that would, would enable chains like optional if present to do something or else do something else. And and you covered that partially. However, uh, yeah. Actually, however, yeah, I, I see the discussion in the in the IRC. I had it open in the background. Um, did you want to read it in, or did uh, should I just go ahead yeah. and answer it? Let, let me just maybe uh, follow up with just like one one more uh, okay. sentence. So the question is, if you want to do something when optional has value, and when you want to do something else when the optional does not have value, uh, kind of like when you showed the two integers and you wanted to add them. So currently, if present, if dropping if present into if block is the solution, but otherwise it would be like really cool to chain everything into a single statement. Uh, do you see any side effects of that or maybe? You know? Yeah, okay, so a uh, bit of background. So, and I do see it mentioned here, but I will repeat it. Um, Roberto said that, uh, uh, so, so there is a new method being introduced in Java 9 called if present or else. And so, so that allows you to, to supply uh, two lambda expressions, one for the present uh, consumer for the present case and a runnable for the absent case or the empty case. Um, and uh, so so that so that satisfies uh, a certain number of use cases. Um, but uh, another aspect of it is that people often want um, even even if the the so so that method returns void. And people people will ask, well, I, I want the optional after that so I can chain more things. And the design goal of, of this API is to deal with the presence or the absence of values and be done with it. And so I think I showed some examples uh, where, where people really go wild with chaining. And I think it, it garbages up the code. So, so the idea is to unpack the... Um, uh, to unpack the value and deal with it, or deal with its absence, and then you're done. Um, so, but but it is true that in Java 8 there are some missing me missing methods uh, that people found use for. Um, I alluded to one, which was the stream method, which is new in in Java 9. Uh, the other one is if present or else, and the third one I I didn't mention at all was uh, it's one simply called or, which allows you to combine this optional with another optional uh, and provide the present value from either of them. So uh, so there are some enhancements coming in 9, which do fill in some holes. That makes Java 9 even more exciting. Uh, I think that sums up pretty much the questions that we got from IRC. And uh, once again, I want to thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, hope. Java developers would use optionals with more rationality behind their decisions rather than just going into the first auto-completed method that their IDEs throw, that, throw at them. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be wrapping this up. And in a mere seven minutes now, we will continue our amazing journey with VJAC24 uh, until the triumphant
finish. So thanks, Stuart, and okay. we'll be we'll be back quite soon. Let me just. All right.